are ready to launch for fall. You know, there's some, <coughs> sometimes this um, the series uh, I'm going to share with you for the next three weeks called Hitting Reset. And there are just some natural times of reset in life, right? It's sometimes it happens when there's significant life change, a, a new job, birth, or a death. Sometimes it's just a seasonal thing. Time to reset, New Year's, spring cleaning, and fall launch. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about hitting refresh. Um, there are times uh, in my life where I just emotionally kind of bog down a little bit. And uh, things start, the gears just seem to uh, clutter up a little bit. And for me, when that happens, I, um, what, I, what I do is I put something in order. I go out and mow the lawn, or I weed the garden, or I sort papers, or I clean my office. And I read an article years ago, whether it was right or wrong, every time you clean your office, it's like you're starting your life over. And um, sometimes that emotional reset has some value uh, just to uh, get refunctioning and get refocused. Well, there's something even more important than an emotional reset, and that's a spiritual reset. And that's what we're going to be talking about the next three weeks, uh, three areas that, um, that are very significant for uh, making sure we get the base set right. Um, I try to do that on a regular basis uh, to renew my perspective, to refocus, to refresh the basics, because it is so easy to bog down. It's so easy as you're going through life and all the stuff going on to get your gaze this way, horizontal instead of vertical. And uh, for us to live out the life God intends in the fullness of joy and the abundance of life, it is a vertical gaze that we need to maintain. So uh, instead of losing freshness and power in our spiritual relationship, a goal to refocus and uh, renew and regain that if any is eroded. So as I launch into, the, into um, this series, these are some things that uh, if you listen to me uh, on an extended period, these are themes that, that, that are woven through my teaching in virtually everything that I cover. Because that is, I think, some of the, the, the three things we'll cover are three core things. So um, our starting place this morning is the base. It's, uh, it's the main thing. And the first question is, so for what, for a Christian, what is the main thing? And if you were going to visit with a number of Christians, you'd probably get a variety of, of responses. Worship's the main thing. Prayer's the main thing. Um, evangelism is the main thing. Uh, obedience is the main thing. You can go through all the Christian um, uh, graces or all the Christian um, activities, and people will respond different. And we understand that we're called out to live the Christian life in a variety of ways. We're, we're called to, to live out Christ, to reflect Christ through all these means that I mentioned and more. But this morning, I want to suggest you to accomplish these things and other elements of the Christian life in an authentic manner, in a, in a manner that's filled with true joy in a way that brings God the greatest glory. They have to come from a thing that we will call the main thing, the thing that lies at the base, the thing that is the root, the causal agent, the catalyst, that from which all other things truly spring. So we're going to talk about the main thing, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, what it is and, and some principles related to it. So the main thing, Jesus, once during his, um, his uh, interactions and journey on earth, was basically asked the question, what is the main thing? We find that in Matthew chapter 22. They'll come up on the screen. Um, Matthew 22, uh, they just uh, had had some, uh, the Sadducees had just asked some questions about resurrection, and Jesus responded and silenced them. They, they weren't able to trap him. So now it was the Pharisees' turn. And here's, here's where we go. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked a question testing him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in all the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. To love the Lord our God with all our soul and mind, 
Uh, one, uh, one commentator defines it as to treasure God above all others, to desire him, to long for him, to enjoy him, to be satisfied in all that he is. And what I'm suggesting this morning is that everything else, even the second commandment, flows out of the first. The first, the foremost, the greatest commandment. Everything else comes out of that. And I suggest that to you on the basis of John 14 and verse 15. So um, John 14, uh, Jesus is celebrating Passover with the disciples. His betrayal, crucifixion are, are soon to happen. He's teaching them. He's encouraging them. He's letting them know what's to come. And in his teaching, he just makes a simple statement. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, um, when I uh, had the chance to share the series on knowing and doing God's will, uh, we, we camped on this just for a brief moment in one of the services. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I want to spend some time on this because um, I ended up learning it a lot different. The way I learned this verse, and i um, not exactly sure how, I learned it this way. If you'll keep my commandments, then you'll love me. Okay? You see how, it, how Christ has presented it. Um, I don't think I'm alone in that misunderstanding. That thinking the Christian life is all about the do's and don'ts, all about conforming and, and, and looking right. And that's what happens when you reverse this. And you know what I found out is that by keeping his commandments, I really didn't develop a love for him. Jesus says this very clear. Actually, he repeats it in verse 20 or 23. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Verse 23, the last block. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Let me just explain a little bit about just the grammatical structure. It's, it's pretty straight and, uh, straightforward. It is what's called a first-class condition, which simply means this. If the first part is true, the second part will be true. Easy illustration. If I go outside and it's snowing, then I'll get snowflakes on me. Follow the correlation? To reverse that gives a whole different message and an incorrect message. If the first segment is true, the second segment is true. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It isn't if you keep my commandments, then you will love me. There's a significant difference. And in verse 23 and 24, Jesus actually expands. He says, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my commandments and something else will happen. My father will love him and he will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word you hear is not mine but the Father's. And as we talk about um, he who does not love me does not keep my words, there's no conditional statement there. That's just a statement of fact. If you don't love, you won't keep the words. In fact, um, if you notice I skipped over that center one, uh, this is structured differently. This too is a statement of fact. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Just a statement of fact, if somebody is keeping God's commandments out of a heart, um, a true, pure heart, desiring to honor and glorify God, the stem, the root, the causal agent is their love for God. And an interesting thing here as well, um, this uh, is echoed in verse 24, the one who keeps, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. Verse 24, um, he, we will come to him and make our abode with him. And just a real interesting and powerful application that as we love God, that we will see him in a different way. It's, uh, you can almost see a spiral effect. Uh, I will love him and will disclose myself to him. And as we see more of God, it will enhance our love for God and we'll see God clearer and better, which will strengthen our love. And that love will continue to grow, continue to abound. Thankfully, that's been part of my marriage experience with my wife. As I've gotten to know her more, 
as we've learned more about each other's heart, it has enhanced our love relationship. It's drawn us closer. It's given us a better appetite, more appetite, to draw closer and closer and closer. And speaking of the marriage, when I serve my wife, it's not because I have to. It's not to win brownie points. In fact, um, when we have one of those special times, you know, where maybe we're not just getting along 100%, I'm, it's probably, probably something that most of you haven't experienced, but I have in my lifetime. One of the, one of the best habits um, that, I, that I try to do on a regular basis is to serve her, even, even when there's friction. Because to serve her is to affirm her value, her worth, but to serve her is also to help me affirm my love for her. Does that make sense? It's an outgrowth. It's not, it's not just playing games. It is an outgrowth. And so this is uh, a uh, specifically um, powerful verse, in my opinion, as long as we get it right. If you love me, Jesus says, then you will keep my commandments. That love spiral. And then we ask the question, because it leaves one of the, I mean, that's just a powerful and exciting thing. If we love God, everything else will flow out of that. And not only that, we will see him better and will grow in greater in love and it will continue and continue to, uh, uh, to uh, move forward. But it leaves one question unanswered. The unanswered question can, can create a great deal of frustration. It, did, it has in my life. So, how do you love God? I don't know if you've ever pondered that or wrestled through that. I believe that most Christians sincerely want to love God. They sincerely um, seek it and they, and they work at it with various degrees of success. If that is the key, if that is the catalyst, if that's the base, if that's the main thing, then how do we learn to love God? Now, if you were to go through this text, and I hope you do the, uh, later today or through the week, and look at some of the texts that we've covered uh, during the service, verses 16 through 20 give an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. And that is an important emphasis, it's not coincidence. The Holy Spirit is certainly an element uh, uh, to help us learn uh, how to love God. But the role of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit actually, as I understand it, amplifies one other key principle that I want to offer to you today. See, uh, just a caution. Sometimes as we, as we uh, live out our Christian life, we, we drift away from a walk by faith, and it becomes a walk of, of works. Um, Colossians 2, 6, as you've accepted Christ, so walk in him. It is all dependent on, on Christ. It's not about what we can accomplish or how we accomplish things. The most significant key, I believe, to loving God comes out of a very simple verse. Many of you have heard, heard the verse. It's 1 John 4, 19. And the, and the verse simply says this. Did you read it? We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. We struggle sometimes in learning how to love God, and sometimes we don't realize that the first significant step is to know, understand, and be confident in God's love for us. I would suggest from this text a couple things. One, our ability to love God and, and others for that matter is fully released when we understand, and, uh, understand God's love and stand confident in it. Second, that we will struggle to fully love God or to fully love others if we're not confident of God's love for us. I really think that's the basis of Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 as, he, as he's praying for the uh, Christians at Ephesus. 
And here are just the main thoughts. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, he writes. And then he says two things, that, that God would allow the believers to be strengthened in their inner being, and second, that they might be able to comprehend what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth of, God's, of Christ's love, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. Because I think Paul understood that was the key. When you understand the power of God's love, it changes you. I believe that that's why Jesus, as he, um, as he spoke to the church at Ephesus in, in Revelation chapter 2, he commends them for a number of very positive things. And then he says this, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember where you have fallen, from where you have fallen, repent and do the deeds you did at first, or I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent, because the key is loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and our, the ability to be able to do that rests in our understanding of God's love for us. So let's unpack that just a little bit. There are things that we draw uh, because of God's love. Uh, God's love allows us to understand what love is. We see pictures of it here on earth. They're all flawed they're all imperfect. It is only the love of God that is perfect, unconditional, and complete. If you go back just uh, real quick to the last slide. Um, 1 John 4.10, one of my favorite verses. I have a lot of favorite verses. Um, probably one of the cleanest definitions of love in the scriptures. In fact, grammatically, it says, this is love. This equals love. That's, that's the way it would, like, two plus two equal four. That's the way it's laid out in, 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 in the Greek. This is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We can draw some, some truths out of what love is. It takes the initiative. It's not that we love God. He reached out to us. Second, he invested sacrificially in sending his son to die on the cross and to meet the, be the propitiation for our sins, to meet the legitimate need that we have that, to breach that or, or span that gulf between us and, and God. God's love, as we understand God's love, we understand what love is. Romans 8, one of many texts, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't because of our merit. It was because God chose to take the initiative and place that love upon us. Romans chapter 8, 28 through 39, if you want to jot that down, worth reading. Uh, talks about God's unrelenting, unconditional, everlasting love for his children. That will be a different study at a different time. But let's continue. God's love, it tell, it, uh, by understanding God's love, we understand what love really is. But second... If we understand God's love, it's God's love that gives us the capacity. Now you can head over to the next slide. Gives us the capacity to actually love. One of the truths of the scripture, one of the truths, one of the realities of the universe is that we are broken people. And separated from God, we do not have the capacity to love as God loves. We, we don't have that, that ability. When God calls us into his kingdom and we, we become one of his children, it creates a capacity, a new capacity in us. And that capacity is to be able to love in a fuller, more complete sense, a, a sense that is more reflective of God's love to us. It's a new capacity. That's why it's important to understand what God's love is and the power of God's love. It gives us the ability to love. But third, and this is where I want to spend a little bit of time, God's love frees us. It frees us because it gives us the capacity, it gives us the security in life and gives us the confidence to love others. Let me just take you on a quick journey here. Maybe it's not your journey, but uh, most Christians struggle with this from time to time. It's this question, how long will God continue to love me? 
I don't know if that's ever rolled through your thinking. Oh, I blew it again. I'm going to be over the limit someday. God can't keep loving me. It's not a matter if he'll give up. It's a matter of when he'll give up. Most Christians wrestle with that. Satan works over time seeking to haunt the believer with lies of that type. And if we are not confident of God's love, it hobbles us in all of life. It also hobbles us in our ability to love God. In fact, um, if you're going through the verses and the texts on your own this week, read through 1 John 4. Because 1 John 4.18, just before we love because he first loved us, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves judgment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. When we understand or are perfected in, and have confidence in God's love, it just chases the fears away because we understand that it's real, it's powerful, it's unconditional, and it's everlasting. Confidence in God's love for us also removes our need to be something we're not. Removes the fear, the reservation from loving others. Removes the temptation to manipulate and control to try to get people to love us. It provides stability in our life and ministry. And it allows us to meet life with solid footing. Because we know we have value. And we know the almighty ruler of the universe is absolutely committed to us and on our side. Does that make sense? Years ago, I heard a speaker. It was just kind of caught the uh, audience off guard when a uh, big, huge guy, he's, marriage is like a boxing match. <laughs> what? And then he went on to say, when my wife is in my corner, there to support me, I can do anything. Let me tell you, that, that has truth. But the greater truth is when God's in our corner, we can stand fearless to life, and we are willing to do anything, and we are able to love and reflect his love because of that confidence. Are you tracking me there? Love the Lord your God, all your heart and soul and mind. Everything else flows out of that. Everything else. Just a quick tangent, a side note. It's a freebie. No extra charge this morning. So I've met with couples that have been um, in high stress. One thing that I've learned that is, is true of the vast majority of them, that relationships don't end because I have quit loving my wife, but relationships end when I think my wife has quit loving me. Yeah, are you hearing that? Because that lights up in me insecurities and reactive behavior. That's where we get back to marriage is like a boxing match. That's where we get back to the core of the base, the causal agent that God loves us and we love because he first loved us. It's an old saying, German in origin, I believe, and that is that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> and so this morning, one of the things that I want to make sure that, that I emphasize, and one of the things that I would consider a failure of the Christian church, is a failure to encourage people to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing, according to the words of Jesus, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Second place where I think teaching often falls short is the failure to help people understand how to develop or increase their ability to love God effectively and from the heart rather than just going through motions. And I can tell you that as best I can understand from the scriptures, it boils down to that simple verse. We love because he first loved us. It's not obedience, it's not outreach, it's not all these positive actions we could be doing. It is understanding 
and trusting God's love for us. There certainly are hygiene elements that are important, like in every relationship, right? Communion versus complacency. Spending time with the person versus just, yeah, they're just here. Um, making sure that we um, maintain commitment over competition. Scriptures talk a lot about that and a love for God to be focused on him and not on other things or not trying to use him to get other things. But the lost foundation is that security and confidence in God's love for us. So as I finish up this morning, I just want to remind you God is still present. He is still faithful. He is still inviting each of us to a closer relationship with him. He's inviting us to learn more and more about himself, which puts us on that growth spiral of seeing him in a fuller sense and then result a greater love for him. And the challenge would be to step into that invitation. And I've given, put some very specific questions up just for you to take home. Question number one, is the base of God's love active in your life? And here's what I mean by that. Uh, some people, uh, maybe you're a guest here, maybe you just come into the church to say, what is this all about? Maybe you've been here for 20 years and have never made that transaction where God's love has become an active principle in your life because you've surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Understanding that your sin has created a wall between you and God and the fellowship that he intends. And that Jesus died to pay the penalty for that sin and to release us into the freedom of a positive relationship with, with the Father. If that's a message that you've never heard or if that's a message you've heard and it's never clicked or you've never chosen to respond, that's a first step. Because it's hard to be confident in God's love when you haven't uh, surrendered to the love. Second thing is, do you have unwavering confidence in God's love for you? That's kind of a, a, a trick question in a sense. It's, it's, it sometimes relates to circumstances, though it shouldn't. I use a material, and it, it, it encourages people to put their, put, mark themselves on a scale between zero and ten. Zero would be, I have no confidence in God's love for me, and ten would be, I have absolute confidence in God's love for me. And most Christians, if they're honest, they will probably be in the six to eight range. And I want to tell you that you can be in the 10 range. Part of um, that, developing that unwavering con, uh, confidence in God's love is to spend time in God's word, reading about his love, to spend time in his presence, to spend time in the presence of others, of somebody else that you know loves God and reflects that. God wants all of us on the 10 because that is the base. That is, that's the point from where we launch all the other things we've talked about this morning. And third, if that love is, is true and if it's there, it will bubble out in all kinds of things. And the question is, how is God calling you to live out that confidence in your life and service? Because if it's there, it can't help but to escape it can't help but to break out and, um, and shine for others. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you will go out and you will change the world for the kingdom. That's my interpretation. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, that, um, that you give us the great commandment for our benefit, that we might be free that um, you might be able to fully live through us. Father, challenge us with these truths. Um, disrupt us. Uh, make us uncomfortable. That we might see those areas where uh, we need to grow in our understanding and confidence in your love and grow in those areas where we need to um, live out that love on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Mark has come up and lead us into communion. Mark.